We should be okay. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, what I had planned to do today is um, bore you to death so you don't come back tomorrow and I can stop. That's my first plan. Um, or alternatively, try to give you an idea of gravitational waves from rotating stars. Okay? I'm going to do this in a very simple way. I'm going to do a fairly long calculation. I'm sure you, you now think I'm a mathematician. In fact, you'll be right, because I work in the maths department. So I have to, in order to be, get paid, I need to use as many equations as possible. Or as one of my colleagues explained to me the other day, uh, the, the paper he was written had to be a mathematics paper, because it had 300 equations in it. And I tried to explain to him that because there was no interesting mathematics in the paper, it was certainly not a maths paper. So we've got a different, but today it's going to be mathematics of his kind, loads of stuff. Um, there is a reason why I want to do this, and that is that um, the mechanism that we often use and think about is very simple, yet uh, when you start trying to put physics in, it becomes really messy. So I want to first do the textbook type calculation on the board, just to give you a feeling for how this comes out. Then we're going to look at how this connects with astrophysics observations. I'm going to take the crab pulsar as my example. And then, having done that, we're going to go over here, and I'm going to use uh, an image, not the latest LIGO data, because I was too lazy to change it yesterday, but it doesn't really matter. I just want to give you a flavor of how the calculation I've done on the board relates to actual LIGO searches now. Okay? Um, and then, having done that, we're going to look at um, how we extend this to another class of system were discussed, namely accreting neutron stars. So what happens if we apply this, more, this calculation to that context? Okay? Uh, and then we're going to see there is a set of systems called the low mass X-ray binaries where there is a mystery. Uh, question is, why don't they spin faster? So I'm going to explain why we think that is a mystery. And then this, this afternoon in the tutorial, what we're going to do, or you're going to do, it's going to do some really dirty astrophysics calculation yourself to solve this mystery. You won't solve this mystery because this is, still is a real mystery, but you might have some ideas about what it is. So that's what we're going to do. Yes, it was kind of a, a bit uh, relativistic. Today is all going to be full on Newtonian physics. We're not going to go beyond this. Newtonian physics plus quadrupole formula is all I'm going to master this, this morning. Okay? So uh, what I want to do is, in principle, very, very simple. Um, and I could just jump straight to the answer and tell you this is what this is. You can it up. Uh, but you won't find any textbook calculations of this. So I think it's useful to do it um, and so that we can understand what goes in. Okay? So I'm going to assume, for the purposes of the beginning, that a neutron star is a solid body that rotates rigidly. So you just think of a metal sphere or a rotating object, but it has some deformation to it. It's not perfectly symmetric. Okay? So I'm going to start off just saying, okay, we've got some velocity, rotation velocity, omega, so the linear velocity is, and then with the the usual sort of solid body rotation, like this with R is the position vector. But because I want to at least pretend that I have my uh, relativity credentials, I'm going to write things down in the coordinate basis. So I'm going to use that's So that just makes it a little bit easier to do a translation to whatever would happen in uh, relativity. Okay? So that just means that instead of writing the cross product, I have the levi civita alternating symbol. I have the position vector x, and then these are just the coordinates, or, or the components of the vector, okay? So let's start, and then I want to start off saying, so this is a position vector. This is a uniform rotation, so the components are constant, and that's just the And also, we need to have, uh, know that xi, xi is just the distance from the origin squared. Okay. 
now the first thing I want to do is I just want to ask, what is the energy and angular momentum of this object? Because I want to introduce the moment of inertia tensor. And then, uh, by deforming the moment of inertia tensor away from symmetry, I'll pick up something that allows me to calculate the quadruple moment, and that allows me to calculate the reduced quadruple moment, and that allows me to calculate the time derivative of the reduced quadruple moment, and that allows me to plug it into the, soon I'll be leaving the room, okay? That allows me to plug it into the quadrupole formula, and that allows me to write down gravitational waves, and then that allows me to compare two observations and ask questions, okay? So it's a long journey, but I think it's worth taking. So the first thing we need is the energy. So the kinetic energy of an object, you know, is just one half rho integral rho v squared integrated over the volume. So what happens here, expand this out, um, this becomes one half the v squared. I need to square this thing. That means I get the product of two of these guys. But if I work it all out, there's a row. Not surprised, an omega squared r squared minus omega i xi all squared, and then dv. And now what I'm going to do, my idea is I want to write the energy as a moment of inertia, so contracted with or multiplied by the velocities, rotation velocity omega, right? Pull out these omegas. So if I pull this out, it's a scalar, so I need to put in some chronic delta or something like that. These guys I can just pull out. So I do that, and this becomes one half omega i omega j times some object. So there's an r squared delta, let's see, ij, chronic delta downstairs, minus xi xj. Now, because these got the constants, I can take them outside the integral. I put these back in, and you see, first guy gives me just the omega squared, second guy gives me this thing. Okay? And then what I do, cunningly, I just define this as an object with two indices, the half, I forgot. Okay. So what I've done is I've defined this guy, which is the moment of inertia tensor. Okay? That's how that goes. And then similarly, the angular momentum is a vector, and that's the cross product, so it's got an i epsilon in it, and then the, just the integral of v, now x, the position, like this. Same exercise, put in this guy, now you need the contraction of two epsilons, that brings in the messy um, chronic delta combination. Work this out. Pull out again the omega, because it's a constant. Integral looks like rho delta ij r squared minus xi xj dv which is splendid because it's exactly the same as I had down here. Well, it has to be because we know the rules of solid body mechanics. Right? So this is just I, I, J, omega, J. Oh, sorry, that should be upstairs now, otherwise I'm in trouble. So now I have this. This is the key agent in calculating the quadrupole moment. Right? And it's worth noting that in the quadrupole formula, I don't want this R. But I want the reduced 
quadrupole moment. Okay? So I need to get rid of the trace of this thing. So that means that I'm subtracting. So there's a minus here as well, which is strict. Sorry. E. That means that you get rid of a bit, like two thirds integral rho r squared dv. And with the delta, I guess, to make it. You can see this from the back, you're lucky, because now I'm scribbling into shape up. <clears throat> but you see, in this context, this piece is constant, right? Doesn't depend on time, because the density is just the same. And so this is a And that means that when I take the time derivatives of this guy for the quadrupole formula, I can just forget about this piece and take the time derivatives of this guy. Okay? So that's one of the important things. And then I have all the information already. I know what it is I want to calculate over here. And then we know that what we want to do is work out, say, the gravitational wave luminosity. How does that come about? Well, there's a number five. Sorry, there's a num number G. And there's a number five. There's a C to the fifth. And an averaging of third time derivatives of this guy. Multiplied with himself. That's what we need, but now, as I said, I can replace this guy with the one without the trace because they're the same. This guy is just constant when I take the time derivatives. Right? The minus sign is completely irrelevant because I've got two of them. So all I need to worry about is how do I represent this? Okay? And that's, of course, where the, uh, the whole crux of the thing comes in. Right? Now, in general, this is a, a very hard problem. It's a very, very hard problem because a solid body, at the moment, I haven't told you what kind of body it is at all. It can be anything. It can be this table. My table or Eddington's table, it doesn't matter. Take, pick this table up and spin it around. This. But um, in the perfect world, you have some symmetries. So that's what we're going to assume. And then, if the body has symmetries, as you know, it's best to work in the frame of the body. So you jump into the rotating frame of the body, and then you use the fact that the symmetries allow you to write the moment of inertia in a diagonal form. So it becomes just an object with three components. They call them I1, I2, I3, with some um, axis. So that's what I'm going to do. And I've got this brilliant illustration. My track record of having images in these lectures is poor, but here's one. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a rotation around the z-axis, and then I'm going to let the three axes, if you like, in the star's body frame be the same as the z-axis. And I'm going to rotate it around, so they have an angle phi, and then I have a one axis and a two axis in the body frame, and x and y in the usual Partition non rotating system. Okay, so that's the setup. Okay. And then what I need is, with that setup, then I need a um, just a not sure if it's easiest to write this out with that, this is or not, but it doesn't matter. I need something like a standard rotation matrix. Um, which has cos phi, the phi is this, oh, no, sorry, that's not a good phi to use if there's another phi in the mid. Okay, uh, the usual rotation around the z-axis. Oh, 
God, my files are all over the place. Okay. And then what you need to do is work out then that I inertial is just something like the, if you do it in tensors, it doesn't matter, the transpose of this times I body times R, something like that. Okay. So now we can go from whatever, and the advantage here is where I'm going to assume that this guy is simple and diagonal. Okay. And then, if, so now what happens, so this is also important to understand, right? what happens is, in the body, this is a solid body. So once I decide what these moments of inertia are, they're fixed, okay? This guy has no time dependence at all, right? I need second time derivatives or third time derivatives. So where do they sit? Well, they sit here, right? So what's going to happen is I need to take a bunch of time derivatives of R that these are going to lead to products of trig functions, right? So I need to take derivatives of this, which is easy. I'm not going to do it, but don't worry. I'm not that crazy, OK? And then I need to average. But these are going to be averages of things like sine squared and cos squared. And you know what they are, right? So something like 1 over root 2 or some number, OK? So you just crank this out. It's pretty, it's pretty long. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it on the board. That would be, well, actually, I'm not sorry I'm not going to do it on the board. You're happy I'm not going to do it on the board. Okay. Okay. But what we find out in the end is that if we write it like this, we've got the three moments of inertia components, I1, I2, I3, depending on, simply saying, what happens if I rotate around the different axes? Okay. And with the symmetry I'm going to choose, it's got AXX is just minus IYY, and then there's half. The difference between I1 and I2 cos 2 phi, and then I, the off diagonal one, is IYX. And that's pretty much the same. I1 minus I2, and this is sine. So now I've, what I've done is I've taken the body frame, translated it in, picked up wherever the product of these guys, and this is all that comes out. And then you take the time derivatives of this, crank it out, add up, and you'll need to, because you're summing, you need to be a little bit careful to make sure you're going to see you're going to get the xx times the xx and so on, and then the xy squared as well. But at the end of the day, what happens is you pick up a bunch of factors of 2, right? Every derivative here brings out the factor of 2. So you just have to keep your tongue in the right place when you calculate, probably, you know, depending on if you, how, how you uh, think about it, but you just pull out a number of factors of 2 to see how many it's going to be. It's going to be one per derivative, but then also when you average to get rid of this thing, you pick up those root twos. Okay. So at the end of the day, you end up with a factor 32. So it's 2 to the fifth. So the final answer just looks like this. All squared, omega to the sixth power. Okay. So this is a, a textbook exercise, so maybe, I don't know what textbook it is, because it probably isn't done in any textbook, as a matter of fact. Uh, well, I think it probably should be, uh, for two reasons. One, um, I think it's always important to go back to the very basics and think about the simple picture. Now, it's all right working on some very complicated problem, but if you don't understand the simple ingredients as to how it, the underlying thing, you don't really understand what the intricate details are of the, of the, of the higher level. Okay, you don't, might not understand why you're doing it in the first place. And I think that, that could be a problem. Second, um, by doing it in detail, I will also understand how to break it. Right? So I can allow this motion to be more general. 
And the typical case that one might want to look at is a processing body where it doesn't move as simply as this. Uh, and the reason why I might want to do that is twofold. Um, there is some evidence, perhaps, that radio pulsars, in some cases, show precession. It's uh, debated, but it's possible. And if they do, that precession motion would lead to a very different gravitational wave signal. So one might want to go back and generalize this. Now, that's not what I'm going to do, but one might want to do it. OK. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, simplify this a little bit. Okay. And so you can see what we've done. We've said that the result simply depends on the difference between if I take this body and instead of rotating that way, rotating this way or that way around the one and two axis. Okay. And so I need to make it asymmetric in that sense. Okay? And that tells, tells me one very, very important thing that people sometimes seem to forget, which is the deformation that you get because the body is rotating. So the centrifugal force will deform any rotating body. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Did we talk about that last week? OK. Um, so that is something that's symmetric with respect to the rotation axis. Right? In that case, these two are equal, so there are no gravitational waves. It's an obvious state, because there are no asymmetries of this body. Right? So in order for it to radiate gravitational waves, I've got to squeeze it as well. That means that these two are different. I need to squeeze it into a cigar, rugby ball, American football, whichever squeeze shape you like. Okay? And the typical way you do that is to say that um, the difference is small because maybe it's easier if things are small. And then it's a small def deviation away from what it would be if it was spherical. And then you just, for now, for the purposes of now, I'm just going to assume that this is a uniform density sphere. So then this is two. Um, uh, mr squared over 5, so it's some number, okay? And then what you do, plug this back in here, and you see that now this becomes an epsilon squared, again with some number and units out front, and that means we are pretty much done. And I should be able to squeeze in the final answer down here. That was my plan. So we got the 32 from before. We've got the 5. C to the fifth. And I forgot the G, which was naughty. Sat up there, but I forgot it. And then there's an epsilon squared, I naught squared, omega to the sixth. So this is that. Final bit. Yeah. So that tells me if I build this cigar shaped star for some reason, given my godlike powers, it's probably not beyond me to do that. Uh, then it would radiate gravitational waves like this. Is this useful? Do stars do this? What kind of epsilon do I need in reality? Okay. Well, I can answer answer that question now. I can start answering the questions, but the bottom line at the end of today is going to be that some of the answers I don't know. So I don't know if stars do this, but I can start asking if it's reasonable. Okay? So the next thing we can do is say, OK, um, what can I do? Well, I can compare what this formula tells me about how a star should spin down as it emits gravitational waves, 
I can compare that to how I would say radio pulse spin down. Right? So the way I do that is not write it, say, in, in rotation period or in omega, it doesn't really matter. So p dot over p um, is just minus e dot over 2e. There's a 2 because there's a square of velocities in, in the energy. And then this is just the formula. But, but I also need e is i naught omega squared over 2. That was the formula I wrote down from the beginning. It's replacing this thing now with a spherical salt. Okay? So this just becomes minus because it radiates energy away. Um, 32g 5c to the fifth. Epsilon squared. I've divided away one of those i naughts. I had the square, but now I've got that. I've got rid of 2 omega, so it's omega to the fourth. Okay? And then I can put this into so what not. So here's my example. The very famous crap pulsar um, that was born in a supernova that we saw, or Chinese, we, Chinese astronomers saw in 1054 AD. Uh, we know how fast it spins. It has a period of 33 seconds today. And it has a p dot, so a change in period um, per unit time, which is 4.2 times 10 to the minus 13 seconds per second, so it's dimensionless. Okay? And if we take our formula, And we say, I have no idea about neutron stars, but I know that they weigh something like 1.4 solar masses, and they have a sort of about 10 kilometers. Then I can calculate that moment of inertia that I wrote down to mR squared over 5, say, from this. Um, plug things in, and I see that this leads to the p dot gravitational waves being it's a number, it should be a minus here, I think, and a minus here. <coughs> 8 times 10 to the minus 7, some small number, and then that epsilon squared. Okay. Now, just look at these two and say, look, this is an equation. I say all the spin down of the crab pulsar is in terms of the gravitational waves. Equate the two. And then I work out what the epsilon has to be. The epsilon I need is just something like 7 times 10 to the minus 4. OK? So what did this tell us so far? Well, it tells us that in order for gravitational waves to spin this object down, which uh, at the moment I'm assuming it is able to do, I need a very, very small deformation, right? This is, a, say, 10 to the minus 3. It means I would have to take this 10 kilometer object and stretch it by 10 meters, something like that in one direction. And you might think, that's not so, so much. It's a small number, right? It turns out this is a whopping big number, but for neutron stars, as we will see. But um, there are other reasons to suggest why this can't be true, and we're going to discuss one of them later, but I'm going to Leave it as it is anyway. Um, one reason why it can't be true is called the breaking index. So that is simply a number, a dimensionless number n, which is the, essentially the second derivative 
So if you want to work a dimensionless number from the second derivative of, say, the rotation, you need two time derivatives, so that's an omega dot squared, but that means you bring in another omega here, otherwise it can't be dimensionless. If you take the results we worked out, we can write down a formula that would, would, that would be. We can just take time derivatives here. We've got everything we need to work this out. In fact, this, I'm going to ask you to do this later, so I'm not going to do this now. But those pesky radial um, astronomers observe these kinds of things and have figured out for that for the crab pulsar, this is about 2.5. And if you had a pure rotating magnet, it would spin down with the breaking index of 3. And therefore, we know already from the beginning that it can't really be gravitational waves that spin this guy down, so this can't be the answer. This is too big. Okay? Already. Nevertheless, for a very long time, gravitational wave physicists were using numbers like this without regarding this fact. And there were plots, I remember plots from quite well, a lot of people showing how, oh, look, we're going to be looking for these things, uh, whereas, and there were other people in the room saying, well, you should be looking the floor downstairs. That's, that's where the signal is going to be. Yeah. And we're kind of, so I'm going to try to point how we're getting closer to, to breaking this kind of thing. Okay, so what's the bottom line of the exercise? Shit by writing down what happens if we work out the gravitational wave strain. So obviously the same counter calculation, take everything the same, take the same time derivatives and so on, but now you keep the, the angles, but I'm just writing down the amplitude. So this is going to be something like, for this case, 8 times 10 to the minus 28, and then I'm scaling this epsilon to a number, let's say 10 to the minus 6. I'm going to be a bit more conservative than this, why not? Uh, gravitational wave frequency of, say, 100 hertz, because that's the sweet spot of, of LIGO, so why not? And, say, a distance in the galaxy, because I know this is weak, so I'm not going to be too, um, too optimistic. And this guy here is twice... comes from twice the spin frequency because of the symmetry. Looking at this body and it spins around, you see it once, once, and once from the gravitational wave. So therefore, the gravitational wave frequency is twice the frequency of the rotation. Okay? Sorry? So the breaking index is just a, it's a dimensionless measure of what the second derivative is. Okay? And so for some pulsars, like the crab and, and about a dozen others, uh, people have managed to track the system for long enough to work out from observations what the second derivative is. And so then they just put this together and they get a number. Uh, the truth is that the breaking index observations are all over the place. There is a sort of range, I think, between 1.5 and 1.4 and 2.6 or something like that. So most of the objects lie there. But for example, we have a paper recently on a very complicated object, uh, the fastest spinning young neutron star, which is an X-ray pulsar. I can't remember the number exactly, but um, it's, it spins at 16 milliseconds a day and it has a negative breaking index. And it has a negative breaking index because it has loads of glitches. Glitches are when pulsars spin up rapidly and then relax, okay? And this guy glitches very frequently. 
And so that complicates this measurement, because obviously in the second derivative, you don't want the guy to do, keep on doing this if you're trying to figure out how the, what the, the, the second derivative is, the curvature, right? So that, it's not clear what some of these measurements mean, okay? In fact, uh, what people, the, the discussion is that it could be that the different breaking indices point to the magnetic field of a neutron star evolving. And trying to understand that is, uh, is uh, another very difficult problem, okay? But that's a very good question. But just taking it at face value, you can see that this is, there's a mismatch here. It's certainly not five. Sorry? Sorry? Um, uh, no. The way people relate the age of pulsars, or try to, is just say, take this, assume that it's this pulsar has spun down a lot, then simply working out the ratio of the spin down rate to the spin, to the spin period gives you a time. It's called the characteristic age. And for some pulsars, like the crab, that works reasonably well. You get something like an almost 1,000 years. It's almost 1,000 years, so you're happy. For others, there could be a mismatch of orders of magnitude. It's not, and actually it gets worse because for the very fastest pulsars, they have undergone exchange, matter exchange with partners, as I'll talk about in a minute, and so then this measure means nothing at all. Okay. So pulsar ages is a, it's a complex issue when you don't have, and even when you have an association with a supernova, if it's not a historic supernova, so you know exactly when it, it happened, and we only have a, a few of those, then there's a mismatch in trying to figure out when did this explosion happen, and you try to do that by comparing, say, the pulsar age that you figure out this way, and say the age of the remnant, which is an expanding gas, say how, with some model as to how rapid that expansion is. And, so, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. This is, uh, I think, uh, when it comes to pulsars, I'm sure that point was made, we're at a beginning of understanding this zoo of possibilities, and we've got many different variations from strong magnetic field magnetars to fast spinning millisecond pulsars and all sorts of things in between. And the problem is we've just got a handful of objects in each kind of category of these special categories. We don't understand that yet, so we need more observations, really. And that's going to come with things like the square kilometer array in the next decade. So that will be very exciting. And then maybe this picture will start, you know, it's like a, a painting where you can start seeing bits but you can't identify the face or anything like that yet, right? But it should come. Okay, so now what do we learn from this? Final bit is that this number is small. Right? And that means that you will have to integrate over this. As I said, the effective amplitude goes a bit like, it goes like square root of the number of cycles here. The frequency is fixed. And therefore, this goes like the square root of the observation time only, something like this. And so you can work out if you think that 100 hertz, the LIGO detector has, say, a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 22, some number. This is roughly 10 to the minus 27. You need to gain a factor of 10 to the 5. That means this number is uncomfortably big, okay? And that means that there's gonna be some upper limit to the size of these things that you can achieve. Okay? Okay, I think I've done enough um, to go and talk about actual data for a second. Sorry, the room is so bad, I can't, when people talk from, I can't hear. So you are saying that the, the, the wiggle in that index yes. uh, has to do with evolution of the attitude. Yes, it could now, do. When you say evolution, do you necessarily mean that the geometry of the magnetic field changes? Uh, I don't know. So um, it's a complicated story. Magnetic field evolution is a very complicated story. Many different aspects. One is a very simple aspect, which is that uh, as a star ages, 
charge currents, the carrying magnetic field might slow down due to friction and the field should decay. Another fact is that when a neutron star is born in the supernova, some material falls back on it. Okay? And if you have fallback of material onto a magnetic field, the field is buried. And then it will emerge on some time scale. So it could be hidden, and that means that the field could the field that we see that spins the star down as a pulsar might get stronger and stronger as the field emerges. Okay? And so figuring that problem out is, is, is complicated to have these competing factors. Okay? And also, it's made worse by the fact that we don't know what the field looks like on the inside of the star. We have no idea. And that's, that's a completely different problem. I really don't want to talk about it. It's too messy. And, um, and the fact that there's different states of matter, like superconductors and so on, that we also don't understand very well. There's a really messy problem, a wonderful problem for someone that wants to spend their life working on a wonderful problem. Okay? Uh, but it, it's, it's hard. At least sort of messy. Okay? So what have we learned so far? We've learned that we can work out a very simple formula for how a rotating body loses energy due to gravitational waves. We've quantified it in terms of a single number the ellipticity, which is the deviation away from, from symmetry, okay? essentially how bar-shaped is this rotating object. Okay? Seeing that we can compare this to how fast an observed system should spin down. Right? And for the crab pulse, we worked out this number. Now this is an upper limit. Okay? It's hard to conceive that you would get more gravitational waves or a larger epsilon than this. So this is called the spin-down limit. Okay? You would not expect gravitational waves above the amplitude you get if with this epsilon in here. If that happened, well, obviously, people in LIGO would be very happy. I would be very happy because that means we have a real problem to solve. But that shouldn't happen. So when people do actual LIGO searches, this is one of the things they compare to, this upper limit. Okay? So here is a set, not the latest one, but the latest one looks the same pretty much. The numbers are just a little bit better. So here is a set from a sequence. I'll use this one rather than the latest one because if you don't look at LIGO noise curves every day, and maybe I hope you don't, Sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you don't, then this, this gives an evolution of how sensitivity, so it's a dimensionless strain, 10 to the minus 27 up to 10 to the minus 23, for those of you that can't, uh, can't read it, we should probably, and then frequency from uh, 10 up to 1,000 hertz. Okay? And it gives you the evolution of the LIGO sensitivity from the third science run down to the sixth, the final science run with the initial de detectors before the upgrade to the current operation. So the current one is, is better, it's down here. Okay? And then it shows where you would expect pulsars to sit in this diagram simply from this calculation with a given integration time of however long the run was essentially. Okay? And so in this case, this is not, we know already from the beginning that this is not long enough to make a detection, probably. Okay? And then you have some stars. And I think the, so the stars are the pulsars for which they've actually set limits. And what you want to do, which is very, very difficult to do by eye, believe me, I've tried, is to stare at this plot hypnotize it like this, okay? and connect a triangle down here with a star somewhere up there to see how, how far away are you from this upper limit. But you don't need to do that, okay? Don't bother. The only thing you need to see is pretty much all the red stars are up here and all the black triangles are down here. So we're, they're not there, okay? Apart from, in two cases, if you look at there's a yellow star way up there, and there's a triangle below it somewhere here. OK? 
Okay? That's the crab pulsar that I talked about. So the story is, and then one reason for showing this perhaps is that for the crab pulsar, LIGO is beating the spin down limit. So that means at least we're now in, and in fact, the number, current number from the most recent, the 01 run, is that for the crab pulsar, there is less than 0.1% or 0.2% or something of what you would need at the spin down limit. So we know that less than a fraction of a percent of the energy is lost to gravitational waves. That's kind of good news. It's not good news if you want to detect gravitational waves, but it's good news in a sense that that means that whatever we're predicting is not contradicting any of this story from mainstream pulsar astronomy. So it's not illegal anymore. If you were to see a gravitational wave signal now, uh, that would be fine. Sorry? It's twice 30. That's right. So, um, yeah. So anyway, you can look up the most recent one. It's an Abbott et al. paper from this year. But it looks a bit like this. I think it's, uh, it's not as nice a figure because the colors are weaker. So if you display it on the screen, no one can see anything, which is a, a bad choice. It might look artistically nice, but not. But uh, in the recent run, they have beaten the spin down limit for, I think, uh, a handful, maybe eight pulsars. So it's getting the Vila pulsar is another one. So that's, the basic story here is the observations are getting that reach into the theoretically allowed regime. Okay? But if you work on this, if you're a LIGO person working on searches for gravitational waves from pulsars, you might want to ask a different question. You might not want to ask what is theoretically allowed, but when am I going to see something? Okay? So I'm going to talk about that question. And that's a completely different question, which has got nothing to do with how much gravitational waves can I possibly emit? But how much am I allowed to stretch this star before it breaks? Okay. So this is a very different um, kind of question. And it takes us to uh, problems that uh, I think people would very much like to solve better now. Okay? So the question is, how large a mountain, I'm, I'm calling these things mountains, you realize that a deformation of 10 to the minus 6 or something like a meter on 10, 10 kilometers is not, uh, is not mountain. But uh, it's maybe optimistic. Yeah? So the, the, um, the story goes a bit like this. You can imagine a body. I'm going to assume that it has a crust. So I'm going to take a more realistic neutron star that has a, an elastic crust and a fluid core. So I'm going to ignore this part. So that's roughly what we think a neutron star looks like in, the, in a cartoon kind of fashion. And then you can imagine that at some point in the past, this body, the elastic matter is completely relaxed. There's no strain in it. They haven't stretched it at all. It has the shape it wants to have. It could be when a new star is born, this crust freezes into a nice shape that it would like to have. Okay? So it has some deviation away from symmetry for whatever reason. I'm going to call it epsilon naught. It's this relaxed shape that it would like to have. Okay? But then something happens to it. I'm going to call this the hand of God.
Nothing wrong with injecting a bit of religion in the morning, right? Um, and I'm going to call it the hand of God for, for a very good reason. The hand of God scenario, the star looks like this. And it has a different lepticity, epsilon. So I called it the hand of God because I have no reason why it should be like that. Again, I don't know what it is that would stretch this star into giving me this computational the big to do with neutron star evolution. How does the system evolve this way? So the calculation I'm going to do is not going to answer that question either. This hand of God thing is still going to be hanging there like a sword over my head, probably dangling by a very thin thread. Okay. But the bottom line is that any matter can stretch if it's elastic and then retain that shape, but it can only stretch so far until it breaks. Okay? So I want to try to quantify, if I take a neutron star and stretch it, when does it break? And that's going to answer how big a mountain am I allowed to build before it breaks. Okay? And that's going to give me a different statement for this epsilon. It's got nothing to do with pulsar observations, okay? but more with nuclear physics. And so what I need here is a simple statement that the strain energy built up in changing, stretching it like this, is some number times the difference between these two squared. Okay? That's just working out. This is a number. We're going to look at what it is in a minute. And the total energy... has uh, a few pieces, it has whatever pieces, if it's spherical and just fluid, it's a piece that's completely irrelevant to me, I'm going to drop that soon. It has the kinetic piece, we will write like moment of inner, or, uh, angular momentum over 2i, this is that a omega squared over 2 for the kinetic rotating energy. right? It has a piece, so this is kinetic, it has a piece due to the fact that I'm changing the shape when I'm rotating due to the centrifugal force, and therefore I pick up a piece of the potential energy that goes like epsilon squared with some number a. And it has that B. This is a schematic. Uh, I don't think we need to worry too much about it. You can see that for a rotating body, it makes sense. I've got something that I would have it to just add potential energy. I've got something that is due to the kinetic energy of rotation. I've got something due to the fact that the change has shaped. That it changes shape a little bit, so there's a piece I have to pick up, and then this thing. And then what I can do is I can work out the actual shape that it would like to have. And I get that for minimizing this energy as fixed rotation rate. Okay? And I do that by also by noting first that this I that sits here is that rotating moment of inertia times 1 plus epsilon. Okay? So this is just a very simple sketch of how it should go. And then what I have to do, which is hard, is put actual numbers here. I'm going to try to sketch how those numbers go without calculating too much. Okay? So what I need to work out is the E by the epsilon at fixed J. And then I set that to zero to minimize it. Okay? And what comes out is that this epsilon, so I solved that for epsilon, it's um, going to be a 
I know omega squared, so some, something that looks like a kinetic energy piece, times these a plus b numbers, in a factor of four, plus a b over a plus b um, times epsilon naught. Um, it's a strain and it's an energy, so it just turns out that the difference in a strain is just a difference between two shapes. That's, uh, it comes from dimensions. You don't need to worry about the details. It is, this is a schematic, kind of how it goes. Okay? You, can, you have, have to work this out in proper elasticity theory to get a real number. I'm just trying to estimate things at the moment, because okay? that's, that's the most important thing. Okay? So at the end of the day, we've got two pieces. The first one, let's call it epsilon omega, and the other one is some number, let's say little b, times that epsilon naught. Okay? So this is the shape that the star has simply because it's rotating. And it's not just the piece that you would pick up because of the centrifugal force. You also have a piece because of this elastic energy. Okay? And then there's a piece that it has because it would like to have um, a different shape. So this is the sort of plastic deformation piece. Okay. So in other words, in a sense, this is the contribution to the shape that doesn't radiate gravitational waves, and this is the piece that does. Okay. Because this is the piece that's associated with the rotation, that has that symmetry, and this is the piece that doesn't. So now let's see how big are these numbers. In particular, how big is B? So there's an exercise you can do that says that the A number is roughly it's the gravitational potential, and that comes out to some number 3 over 25. Just doesn't really matter what the number in front is. And then just gm squared over r. The B is much harder because that's got to do with uh, the elastic matter, but essentially comes out as a number that comes from new physics called the shear modulus. Which depends on what kind of lattice you have in this elastic matter and so on, so it's complicated. And then the volume of the crust by two. But this I can quantify a little bit better, because the volume, I can just think of the crust as being thin, and then the volume is just the spherical area times delta r. So this just becomes a 2 pi mu r squared delta r. <clears throat> okay. And that means I can build this B and I can write it after a little bit of thinking as something like this. So here I've sca I'm scaling things in such a way that we can see what's big and what's not. A number and then essentially M over R inverse r in dimensionless form, delta r, the thickness of the crust over the size of the star, and then another dimensionless number, this shear modulus over the density times c squared, and this turns out this is a velocity squared. So, sorry, sorry, mate, let's just do it like this. So mu over rho So this is also dimensionless, it's a velocity over the speed of light. Okay? Now this is a uh, order ten over m dimensionless is order five. This is looking good, you know, it's not 
is now 50. This is one kilometer per 10, so I've lost a factor of 10 here. And this is a very small fraction of the speed of light squared. This is a small number. If you put in actual numbers, this is something like 10 to the minus 6. Oh, or I think, actually, 10 to the minus 5. If you put in the numbers, well, maybe that's too optimistic. Let's just do it like 10 to the minus 5. And let's not put that. And now, you can see what we would have to calculate, okay? If I wanted to make this realistic, I'd need to calculate a stellar model, M and R. I need an equation of state. Right? I need to work out how the crust is. I need a crust equation of state to know how deep into the star does the crust go. Right? I need to know the shear of this elastic matter. I need, you need to tell me what kind of crystal is this lattice. Okay? So what is this guy? And then the, the row I have, of course. Then I need to know the speed of light. We do. Okay? So this is a hard calculation. If you do this better, this number gets smaller. Okay? So what is the point of this exercise? Well, the point of this exercise is we know that this b is a very small number. And that means, because this is not such a small number, that the shape that an actual star will have is pretty close to rotational shape, OK? So it is not possible for realistic neutron star to be very deformed away from that rotational shape. Rotational shape is much bigger always. So we expect to have that being the real shape of the star. But this did not to the question. How big am I allowed to make this difference? So when does it break? And unfortunately, that's a very difficult question. Very difficult question even for metals, say, on Earth. If you want to ask a... Um, Material scientist, when does a bar of metal break? How much am I allowed to bend it before it breaks? Not a pane of glass, that's, that's easy. That breaks as soon as you look at it. But when does a metal bar break? How much can I bend it before it breaks? Not bends, but snaps. It's a very hard calculation to do. And what people tend to do is they tend to try to write this in terms of a dimensionless number called the breaking Let's call it sigma break, something like that. And so the way you can calculate this is you can set up on the computer a lattice of particles that want to form an elastic thing. And then you can just shunt it, like let the computer do this to it. Jiggle it until it snaps, okay? until it just obliterates. And that's what people have done for the neutron star crust. A guy called Chuck Horowitz in Indiana does this for a living. He's very good at it. And what he found when he did this, the first simulations a few years ago, he found that the star is stronger than we thought. In fact, it's super strong. It's the strongest material they have ever looked at. Okay? Which is great. Right? It means you can stretch it a lot. So this number comes out as 0.1. It's a dimensionless number again. And then what you can do is you can ask, 
how much is this deformation epsilon allowed to be if I scale it to this number? Okay? So that's the way we wanted to get. Potentially, this epsilon is smaller than 5 times 10 to the minus 6 times this guy. So that's the largest mountain I'm allowed to build on a neutron star has this epsilon of this magnitude. Okay? Now if you remember the spin down limit for the Crab pulsar, this was 10 to the minus 4. Okay? So this is a more severe limit than the spin down limit. I'm actually not allowed, according to nuclear physics, to build a deformation on the crab pulsar of that magnitude. It cannot happen. Because it is now a warning sign. In fact, there are two big warning signs on the board. One, I know already that it couldn't be there if this is true. Okay? Two, it probably can't be there anyway because I just put in the hand of God to put it there. Okay? So there are two avenues you might want to think about improving this. One is um, this aspect. How much difference does it make if you change the physics of the neutron star interior and the crust and so on? And the other one is, can I think of some ways of why a neutron star would like to do this? Why should it happen? What is the astrophysics? What is the evolution of the star that says it ends up like this? And so when it comes to justifying searching for these signals, at the moment, theory is a very poor supporter. Because we can only say, how large are you allowed to build these mountains? If we stretch the star by hand, we can't say, you should expect this to happen. Of course, it's a terrible position for someone that does observation, because they really want to know, when am I going to see something? Is it before I retire or after? Shall I carry on? You know, is my time better spent doing something else? Unfortunately, again, theory is a very poor supporter. Theorists have far too much fun using the hand of God. Okay, so. Before we finish uh, this morning, I want to do another thing. I want to talk very, very briefly about how nature could do this to set us up for this afternoon. Okay? And so there are two aspects. First one, I think I have a. The first one goes back to what I talked about in the beginning, the low mass X ray binaries. And so here's a very recent uh, histogram of the observed accreting fast spinning neutron stars. Okay? Um, so this comes from a paper that's on the archive. Uh, it's got my name on it somewhere at the end because I didn't do anything. I hope this is recorded, so that's now official. Um, but what this histogram shows is a couple of very interesting things. The first thing you need to know, a calculation I could have done now, but I, I don't have time, it shows you how fast a neutron star can possibly spin before it breaks up. Okay? And that answer for typical equations of state come out to be over a kilohertz or thereabouts. So here. In an accreting system, a star accretes matter from a companion, and it gains angular momentum as it does that. So it spins up. So if there is a system that provides a torque, there is no reason for it to stop until it gets to over here. 
But as you can see, there's a bit of a gap here. And so what people are trying to do is explain why is there a gap. And you will see uh, in the literature quite a few suggestions for how gravitational waves could explain this gap. Okay? And our job for the last 10 minutes and this afternoon is to have a look at how credible that idea is. Okay? So that's your mission for later. And what you're going to learn is if you thought the problem I gave you yesterday was hard, partly because it was badly formulated, this problem is hard because it's really messy. So today we're doing really dirty astrophysics, okay? But that's part of this game. So there's another, so what you could imagine is um, the accretion torque has a certain form. Let's just go write down a few simple things to get more info, info later. Basically, what you can imagine is that the angular momentum of the star changes as matter is accreted at some rate m dot, and you just deposit this material at the surface of the star. Right? And then you can relate this to what we did simply by noting that for any radiation it's true that E dot is omega J dot. Or for any rotating body, you can see that this is true from what we did earlier. And then this can, you can then use to work out um, how large an epsilon do I need from the gravitational waves that lose energy and angular momentum to balance this guy that gains angular momentum. Okay? And if you do it right, you're going to find that this is a small number. And it could be a small enough number to explain this. The first I'd suggestion that will be the case comes from a paper by Lars Bilstein in 1998. It's a very, very famous paper. Um, at that time, we didn't have these fastest ones. It was a clustering down here. But the argument is exactly the same. And the argument is very is that this accretion torque here doesn't vary much with, doesn't change much with the rotation rate. Whereas this E dot, the gravitational wave energy loss went like the sixth power of the spin. Okay. So as you spin the star up, gravitational waves are completely unimportant at slow spin rates. But as you get higher up, you hit a wall when the gravitational wave torque suddenly kicks in because of that difference in, in spin scaling. Okay? So if that were true, what would you expect? You would expect these guys to stop at some point where you get to the gravitational waves dominating. Okay? And perhaps, this is a very suggestive diagram, you would expect a pileup of more systems at the higher spin rates than you see at the lower spin rates. Now, this is very small number statistics, but I'm not a statistician, so I'm allowed to play games. Uh, the paper we have recently uh, looks at this distribution statistically and basically argues in a proper Bayesian way, right, that there are two populations, a peak and a flat, more or less. Now, whether that's true or not, I think will be brought out by more observations. If that is the population, then there is a need for something to explain that peak. It could be gravitational waves. It could be changes in that accretion torque, because this is a very, very naive expression. So this afternoon I'm going to give you another expression that's a little bit messier, but more realistic to play with. And we're going to try to explore together 
how this kind of idea could work. Okay? Just to get a flavor of how, for how messy is this kind of problem, how messy is the logic, right? I would obviously like to be able to say, yes, gravitational waves definitely do this, but that's a very, very hard argument to make. So we're going to do that. We're going to look at, OK, suppose you calculate this number, how much gravitational waves you could get. How small is that amount? Would you ever be able to see that with LIGO? Is, are there other reasons why maybe you won't? It's a wonderful problem again, but accretion physics is very complicated. And I still haven't told you, why should it be that the star deforms to radiate gravitational waves as it accretes? The difference is, at least now, you have some idea, matter is piling onto this body. So maybe if that is not happening in a symmetric fashion, so if the star has a magnetic field, you can imagine the matter is funneled onto the magnetic poles. So it's got a little bit more pile of material there. That will deform the star, and maybe that can do the job. There are many different scenarios here. Hand waving is easy. Calculating is very hard. I think that's a, maybe a good place to stop for the morning. I know I'm early, but there you go. OK, so thank you. <clears throat> But because I stopped early, if you have any questions, anything you want to talk about, you're just desperate for coffee, desperate to get out of here, desperate to get calculating, don't smile at me like that. Come on. No questions? Yes. Oh, why it is the number it is? OK. So, I think it's something like this. It's some range. I can't, it's not the latest. So, this is a problematic set of numbers, okay? From simple theory, If you have a rotating magnet that's tilted like this, and it spins down due to electromagnetic emission, that number should be 3. Okay? The number we would calculate is 5. Okay? This is not 3, and it's not 5, but this is quite close to 3, so maybe it is 3. Give or take. You know, this is not a sophisticated theory, so maybe Three is good enough, okay? And then there is another one, uh, which is um, just particle emission, which people call wind, which can lead to pretty much any number you like, but it can be a small number. And so the bottom line is that there are two aspects. One is we can only measure this breaking index for fairly young pulsars. Like they have to spin down fast enough, so they have to be stable enough that you can measure the sort of second derivative. It's a difficult measurement, uh, especially if pulsars have some jitter, some glitches, like the crab does, like the vela does. So those, the vela one is the 1.4. It glitches quite frequently with large changes. And the way that breaking in this is estimated is very different from how it is for, for a quiet object. And so when you plot this, uh, I'll, so maybe I, I can uh, sketch it. It's going to be wrong, but it doesn't really matter. You've seen the P dot, PP dot diagram, okay? Where the pulsars live sort of on something here, where you have constant spin magnetic fields and constant ages going like this across, just sketching how the pulsars are, okay? Now what you can do is you can draw on this diagram which way the pulsar is evolving right now? If you know the second derivative, right, you, get, you can draw an evolution here. Okay? And what you expect is that, really, pulsars, if they don't evolve at all, they should just follow these constant magnetic field lines like this. Okay? That would be three. Okay? I'm going to sketch my impression. This is like an artist's performance. You know, 
it's going to be sold probably in an art gallery later. Uh, so I'm not basing that just to roughly how some of these things go. So we have systems going a bit like this, which is not too bad. But then we have systems going a bit like this, which is disaster. Okay? And so the way an observer interprets this guy is that because these are constant magnetic field lines, the magnetic field increases. Right? Just by looking at this, this diagram. And if you have an astrophysics reason to think that the um, magnetic field would be increasing, say, as I said, because it emerges from having been buried or for other reasons, then maybe that story makes sense. And so what you can imagine then is that the actual evolution of a radio pulsar is something like this. No? And at different points, depending on where you catch it, it will point in different directions, a tangent to this trajectory. Right? And that story is not unappealing. And if you look at people that do evolutions of magnetic stars, that this is kind of what they come up with. Okay. But uh, I think the reality also is that we don't have enough measurements of the breaking in this. We would need more. That's going to come again with uh, things like the square kilometer array. We will be able to track more pulsars and more quiet pulsars. So this picture will, will change. But I think, again, this is a very good question to think about in sort of neutral star physics in general. Would you agree that to extent this is sort of uh, having a stroke? If you look at if you look at the graph, uh, the we know that the electromagnetic luminosity of the pulsar can account for <coughs> p dot. So that should settle it because its breaking index is a red herring. It assumes a dipole model for the slowing down. But it's slowing down to uh, pointing first. And it doesn't have to be three in the first. Mm -hmm. But as far as the cap is concerned, the matter is settled. And there is no room for, except at the, below the level that you know. So in the future, when uh, you get there, you may be able to check. But at the moment, there is no reason to suspect that the fact that the breaking index is not three may have some. No, I, I think that's right. Uh, the, so that, that's my, my feeling too. For the systems where the breaking index is close to three, you have no problem at all. If you have find an object where it's um, very large or very small, then you have issues where you need to worry about either that you don't understand the physics or you don't understand your observations. I think today, technique for extracting the breaking index from some pulsars is let's say, not controversial, but it's certainly not settled as to how you actually, what this number that you get from observations various ways, what it actually means. Okay. So there's, there's scope for that as well. But I think for the, for the well-established uh, cases, Crab is the best case, I think, the lesson you learn from this is simply that there is not room for gravitational waves at that most optimistic le level, right? You should not expect that. And I gave you the other reason for that you can't build mountains of that size anyway. Was there one more question? Sure. OK. How can it occur? A million dollar question. A man looking for a future and a research breakthrough. OK. I, I wish I knew the answer. Um, so, my feeling, that, so there are two answers. Um, one answer is, this is astrophysics. The answer is always the magnetic field. As usual in astrophysics, you also need to know what is the question. Okay. Um, so the magnetic field, I didn't sketch that, um, but I could have done. You can estimate how much the magnetic field can deform a neutron star. Okay? 
The magnetic field will have tension if you have a normal dipole field, poloidal field, it's going to push the matter out. If you've got a toroidal field, it's going to push the matter up. So the field deformation is a, com is a tug of war between that and that. Okay? So how stand but that means you need to know what the internal magnetic field configuration is. So I think it would be fairly non-controversial to say that we do not know that. We can calculate certain things, but I think there are various reasons to believe that what we calculate is not what we should be calculating. And the reason is that pretty much every single magnetic field configuration for the neutron star interior that has been calculated is not dynamically stable. That means that a star would not like to stay there. Okay? So we can calculate something, but it can't be, it doesn't seem to be what we should be calculating. So there's, there's another big mystery. Sorry, the, the more, this morning is just full of stuff we don't know. But you can estimate, given this ignorance, how big would this magnetic field deformation be? And so the tip you would get for a typical, say, crab pulse of magnetic field of 10 to the 12 gauss, if that's the number, is 10 to the minus 9 in deformation. So that's too small. But that would be the minimum. If I could calculate uh, a proper, so if I could understand the question of the interior magnetic field configuration, which is also a great question because it links with this thing, the field evolution, the breaking index evolution, all these things, if I could calculate this, I could set the floor for when you would have to start seeing gravitational waves from pulsars. And the answer might be depressing in the sense that you might have to wait a thousand years to LIGO generation, generation 462, uh, but at least then you'd know that it has to happen at some point, right? But it's, it's a very hard problem. Again, a problem that has some debate going on as to how one should actually do this. So that's one answer. I know one way of doing it, but it's not necessarily very good. Another way to ask is, okay, what happens when the star is born? A neutral star is born, it's hot, but it cools down quickly. The crust, this elastic matter that can carry the def deformation, will form, freezes, and then it gradually extends for a while, over a few hundred years, until it forms it. So, it, during that time, the star spins down. So it could be that you form the crust, but the star spins down, so it change, wants to change its shape. The crust doesn't like to change its shape, according to my hand of God picture. At some point it breaks, and it could be that the way it breaks starts causing asymmetries in this. But now I've just sketched a very, very difficult evolutionary scenario where you have to keep track of how this crust, what shape it had, what shape it would like to have, and how it moves between these shapes. Okay? This is a really hard problem, even in, in the laboratory, in, in engineering. You know, how does material break? To simulate that is hard. Sorry, everything is hard. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear everything is easy, right? But this is hard. So this, this is an open question, and I think we would like to have an actual scenario for how this works. Why should it be? That's a missing piece beyond the hand waving. Okay? I think maybe there is a good place to stop and have coffee. Thank you for this morning. <laughs>